Will never end. 
Psalm of 647 for the Song of Invitation, 647. Let's all stand and sing 434. <coughs> Looking to thee, we sing all three verses and try to listen up with Brother Dale. Looking to thee from day to day, trusting thy grace along the way, knowing that thou wilt save the King, all that is thine. Sure of thy soul, redeeming love, sure of a crown of life above, singing thy praise, I press along, Savior divine. Trusting thy wonderful grace, I am as happy as a true soldier can be, never can be, nearing my heart, and my Lord, and we live in the heavenly place, trusting thy love, I press along, looking to thee, yes, looking to thee. To thee for all I need, I think in thee, a friend indeed, all of the burdens of the day, meekly I bear. Neither the foe nor storm I fear, Savior divine, for now I'm here, ready my cares and troubles all, freely to share. Trusting thy wonderful grace, I am as happy as a true soldier can be, ever can be, dear in his Savior, my Lord, beautiful heavenly place, trusting thy love, I press along, looking to thee, yes, looking to thee. While in heaven bright, where there is neither sin nor night, I shall be holy, faithful. 
Most of the major decisions in our lives are decisions that we reach based upon our background of information and the longings that we have, the desire of which direction we want to see our life going, and those factors all come together to help us come to what we hope would be righteous decision making. But for some people, that's not the way it works. For some individuals do not see a value in godliness. The idea of that which is good does not really appeal to them all of that much. In fact, as we begin to sort of look at the numbers, we might say, from Matthew chapter 7, Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount talks about the choices that people will make. And he said there is a broad path that leads to destruction. And he said that is going to be a very well-traveled path because many will make that choice. In Matthew chapter 7, and verse 13, he says, In the end of the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. The Lord's talking about the attraction that some people have for evil. To them, it's more enticing. They are drawn down that path, oftentimes with great eagerness, because they don't want to think about the consequences of sin, the wages that it eventually will pay. They're deceived into believing that this is going to be joyful, this is going to be pleasurable, this is something that I'm going to do without maybe much harm or hurt to me, and I'm going to be able to sort of get a leg up on everybody else, even though I may have to use devious and sinful ways to do it. It's all about me and where I want to go in this life. They believe the deception of Satan. And that's what they see, that's what they are drawn to, that illusion of success, for they fail to see who is the author of such deception. Jesus talked about Satan over in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So Satan lays the net out there, so to speak. He sets the trap. And just as we do whenever we're hunting or fishing, oftentimes we want to put the bait out there that's going to draw in the game that we are wanting to, to uh, hunt or to, to fish for on that particular occasion. Well, Satan is looking for the soul. And he lays the bait out there, and many are drawn to the excitement of his evil way. But we find in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, that Paul simply gives us in very plain terms what's the consequences of following that illusion, entering into sin and reveling in that, and failing to understand the importance of godly choice making. He says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oftentimes, as we're going through various stages in our lives, there are certain things that have tremendous appeal to us. We go through a spell sometimes of wanting to be rebelliously individualistic. I want to do what I want to do, and no one has the right to tell me anything. And so in our rebellion, we're going to oftentimes purposely go against the best advice that we're given because it's all about me. I'm going to prove that I'm the exception to the rule, that I can do what I want to do, and it's not going to phase me. There's not going to be any consequence of a negative sort for me because I am just so strong and I am just so courageous that I'm going to dare to do that which is inappropriate. In my years of school teaching, you often found that with some students who wanted to make their own mark. 
They wanted their attention, however they were going to get it. And oftentimes they were daring in their rebellion. They said and did things that they knew full well were breaking rules and going to cause chaos. But they didn't care. The important thing was, I'm going to do what I want to do, and everybody else is going to have to get used to it. And so they tried to be drawn to this sort of self-assertiveness as to what I'm going to do. And sometimes it's motivated by anger. I'm mad at the world. This hasn't worked out right. That hasn't worked out right. It's not been what I wanted it to be, so I'm going to get back at somebody. I'm going to demonstrate the, the way I feel. I'm going to, to stand up for myself, even if that means going way beyond any kind of discussion that can be constructed. Rather, instead, they will turn to whatever outrageous behaviors they may choose to do just to show that they can do it and to find some distorted sense of satisfaction in venting their anger. It may be even doing bodily harm to somebody else, destroying somebody else's property, knowing that such actions could bring negative consequences, but they're just drawn down that way. I have a right to do this. I should be entitled to do this. No one should tell me what I can and what I cannot do. Or maybe it's all for the sake of popularity. I will do whatever it takes to have friends, and I will do whatever it takes to be popular. If that means crossing the bounds into immoral activity, so be it, because I'll have friends as long as I am loose with my moral behavior. I'm going to do whatever it takes if I have to lie or frame other people and try to make them look bad so that somehow my candle's gonna shine brighter. In all of those distorted ways, they see a justification. That it's all okay, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And they are blinded to what the scriptures call the good way. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter four, going down to verses three and four, here Paul writes to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians four, three and four, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Don't talk to me about that Bible stuff. Don't talk to me about Jesus. Don't talk about what's good and what's bad. It's all about me. I'm going to do what I want to do. And they love to have it so. They're caught up in what John says over in 1 John chapter 2, are the things of this world. They're not worried about a life after this one. It's all about the here and now and what I can accomplish for myself. Over in 1 John chapter 2, going down to verse 11, he, he talks here about the darkness that can blind our eyes. He says, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness has blinded his eyes. Well, what's he into? Drop down to verse 15. He said, Love not the world, and neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it's not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And that's our prayer that those that are drawn into the ways of iniquity will one day have a happening in their lives where they will begin to reconsider. That maybe they will get tired of the repeated failure and the heartbreak that they brought upon themselves by the choices that they've made. And maybe like the prodigal son, there will come a day when they're looking for something better. I want to go home. I've got to get this straightened out. And maybe that day will come and we pray that it will. And we keep, in the meantime, teaching the right way. To be drawn to the Lord. To love that which is good. To don't go down that sinful path. Praying if they will listen and respond. But then there are others who are kind of on the fence. There are individuals who want to be drawn to Christ. 
but they see Christ as being weak and that Christianity is a boring way of life, that it's not going to afford them the kind of joy that they are seeking, and they want to be on the side of a winner, and they're not talking about the idea of eventually having a home in heaven when this life is over. They're once again looking at life as the here and now. I want to be happy. I want to do what I want to do, but I also want God's blessing on the things that I do. And so I kind of want to, 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 to follow the Lord, but He's just, He doesn't solve all my problems. There are things that happen to me that that shouldn't happen to anybody. And, and the Lord should, should have handled those kinds of things and made the outcomes better. They don't take a lot of responsibility for their own poor decision making. It's all kind of laid over on the, the shoulders of the Lord. And the Lord should have given me better choices. The Lord should have fixed this. And since he didn't, he's not much of a Lord. He's not much of a God. Look at all the things I've had to go through in my life. Look at all the things that didn't work out right. And they don't see that they had a hand in that by their own poor decision making. They want to lay the blame over on God. He should have fixed things. He should have been victorious. If God is so great, then God should alleviate all the, the suffering in the world. And God should give me a, a better life. And God should make happiness for, for everybody. And, and God should have just taken more control. And since he hasn't taken more control, and so many people are bumping into mistakes and kind of going down blind alleys and, and having calamity in their life, God's responsible for that. And if that's the kind of God that you want to worship, uh, I, I'm not in on that. Because I'm wanting a God that's going to, you know, bust people and take names and come out on top and show me, you know, very clearly how great and powerful he is. Sometimes we take this idea of materialistic success and we think that this is, if this isn't here, then somehow God is weak and, and, and ineffectual. But that doesn't change the hearts of people. God could lay all kinds of good choices in front of us. But would we really appreciate it? Would we really look at the way things have unfolded and, and thank God that he's given us such blessings? Or would we rather assume that it's me and because I'm so brilliant and I've just made all these good choices? And once again, God is erased from the equation. He didn't have anything to do with it. It was all me and my genius that had these good things to happen. The Bible helps us to understand that might does not always make right. And we see that demonstrated over and over again. Think about just taking an example from, from current events, if you will. You know, we talk about what's been on the news here a whole lot with the, the Russians invading the Ukraine. And there's been some stories I've passed along along the way of some tragedy that's gone along with that. Here are some couple of people, Sergei and, and, and Sister Lily, they were members of the church in the Ukraine who died in the course of the war being fought over there. But let's just say that the Russians with superior military might and whatever eventually win. They take the territory, they topple the government, and now they are in power, and everything is owed to us because we are the victors. Are the Ukrainian people all of a sudden going to love them because they won the battle? Will the Ukrainians love these new victors that have taken over everything? and turned our world upside down. Or while they may be forced into some kind of servitude to the new power, will there still be that festering heart that's so angry over those that they knew that died in the fighting and all the freedoms and rights that were taken away from them. Just because you have the might 
does not mean that you're going to be able to impose righteous will on everybody else. And often we fail to understand this battle is not for the attitudes, love, and adoration solely of people. We are turning to God because our heart changes. As uh, Kyle made the point in the meeting this past week, he helped us to understand that Paul was wanting to see Christ grow within each one of the Galatians. If they would understand the only one they're really answerable to is the great God of heaven. And am I doing the things he has commanded? So to those who have this, this view of, I'm, I'm going to follow winners, and, and Jesus hasn't created enough victories in my life for me to follow him, as long as they persist in, in that vein, then service to Christ, submission to God, is not very high on their agenda. But then we notice what Jesus said there in John chapter 12. We find that Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. What draws the honest heart to God is that they see goodness. Here they are able to see sacrifice. They're willing to see that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now to the prior group that we talked about, they haven't got a whole lot of respect for Jesus because he let himself get crucified on the cross. To them, another mark of a loser. And so they don't see the value of what was accomplished by Jesus being lifted up on that cross. But as we look to some of the comments in the book of Revelation, it helps us to visualize, I think, a little what was accomplished there on that cross. In Revelation chapter 7, going down to verse 9, there is a, a scene depicted here, many of the, the visions that, that John had in he sees a great multitude that's clothed in white raiment. And in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 7, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Here we see this massive crowd of folks from everywhere that are praising God. They've been cleansed from their sin. They are arrayed here in white robes, and they're offering adoration to the Lamb. Skipping a little farther down, think about that Lamb. What did it take for him to be on that throne? It took a cross. Moving on down to verse 13. And every one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That lamb that appeared to have been slaughtered by the victorious connivings of the Jews and the Romans rose again the third day. Now he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Here he's found on the throne. The lamb that died. 
whenever we begin to think of his life and the worth of that life, we find some things to admire, some things that we want to emulate. We begin to get an understanding of what is good. And we find here even the value of the concept of being a martyr. Here Jesus laid down his life as a sacrifice for man. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. Sometimes he's referred to. He was so enthused about his message and was so truthful in his presentation of it that they took him out in stone. But he didn't recant the message. He didn't back away. But rather instead he asked for forgiveness for those who were mistreating him and commended his spirit to God. Because he realized he was simply in small measure following the steps that Jesus took before him. In Romans chapter 5, go down to verse 6. Paul writes, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Now I'm looking at the Revelation passage, and it's going back to that same reference that we're talking about with the, the lamb uh, being on the throne and being worthy of adoration. Paul's comments in Romans chapter 5, beginning in, in verse 6, he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let that soak in. As we realize how unworthy we were, and yet Jesus was willing to go through the agony of that cross so that through his blood we might be redeemed. That we might be num numbered in that innumerable throng of individuals who chose righteousness, who adored God, who realized that he was willing Father was willing to send his son, his son was willing to endure the shame of the cross so that we might live. It's hard for us to begin to wrap our arms around that great love. As Paul says here, you know, some would, well, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. He died for us. One way to look at it is let's, let's go to the idea of somebody being an organ donor, which is a crude parallel. An individual dies in some unfortunate circumstance, but yet the organs harvested from that individual is able to give life to somebody else. There are many people on waiting lists hoping that there will be a match for them and that maybe they will get a new organ that will allow them to have continued life. And you know what? If that organ is not found, if a match is not made, eventually, sooner rather than later, their time's going to but whenever the organ is found and whenever that blessing has been bestowed upon somebody else, what do you suppose is going to be the attitude of the recipient? There's going to be appreciation and a thankfulness that they've been given extended years of life even though somebody else had to die in order for them to have such a blessing. And on and on the illustrations could go. The idea of what would happen if somebody found out that here is an individual that has a very rare and special kind of blood, and that kind of blood has antibodies in it that would cure cancer. And so now there is this idea, we need to get that blood and harvest that blood, and we need to make this remedy for as many people as we can possibly get it to. What would be the feeling? 
those individuals who saw the cancer go away. And they survived for longer span of time. When you begin to look at that, they would go back thinking to how important that one person was. The uniqueness of their blood and the remedy that came from it. Jesus hung on the cross and shed his blood so that all men might have the remedy for the worst disease of all. And that's the spiritual disease of sin that can keep us out of heaven. In Romans chapter 12, Paul talks about what it is that actually can change the hearts of other people. It's not going to be because we're stronger than they are and we can beat them into subjection and we can make them do what we want them to do. That's not the kind of God that we serve. But we deal with evil every day. But we overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 19. Paul says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You want a victor? One day he is going to be a victor in the biggest terms possible. Maybe not here, and maybe not now, as we see it. But he said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. You do what's the right thing to do. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what changes things. That's what draws us to the cross of Christ. Here was a man who had no sin. He was the son of God. He did everything right. And yet, even though he was abused and killed, he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Here we find something that can change our hearts. Something that can change our viewpoint. Something that will change our allegiance from reveling in sin and trying to be somebody to being a servant of the Most High God. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul spends a lot of time here talking about the characteristics of love. And in verse 13 of that chapter, he says, Now abide faith, hope, and charity, or love. These three. What's the greatest one? The greatest of these is love, or charity, as the old King James Version says. Sometimes love appears to be weak. Sometimes Love appears to lose. It seems to be powerless. But it has a message and it has an effect that cannot be easily measured. And so we are drawn to the cross and to the price that was paid for our redemption. It is with appreciation we look to what God has done and the love he has shown. Last passage in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in about verse 4, we find John talking about this. He says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. That's why the cross has such power. It draws us and focuses our attention on the love of God. And as we see that love so plainly manifest, it makes us see, what am I? And what can I do to please him? How can I be like that? Our hearts can be changed. We're not just reaching out to follow the crowd. We're wanting a one-on-one -on -one with God. That our lives are made righteous through the blood of Christ. And we can serve him the rest of our days and go home to heaven when his life is over. But this morning, if there's some steps you need to take to make this relationship right with God, being baptized, the mission of sins, and coming back to you straight away. If there's any way that we can help you, won't you come? As together we sing. <laughs> oh, most persuaded.
as we continue our worship unto God on the first day of the week, we remember the suffering, the death, the shedding of blood by the Savior there on the cross that made the way for us to have the remission of our sins by partaking of the Lord's Supper. The bread, which is to us his body, the fruit of the vine, which is to us his blood. Brother Skipper will express thanks for the bread. Johnny Waddle will express thanks for the fruit of the vine. Also commanded to lay by in storm on the first day of the week as we have prospered. Baskets are available in the building for you to have the opportunity to do that. Are there announcements that need to be made from the audience from anyone at this time? If not, as always, certainly we need to remember those of our number that are sick and cannot be here. Remember the Lane family, certainly in their time of life. Remember our services here this evening at 6 o'clock. There will be nothing else at all from anyone. I'll ask everyone to stand after a song. Brother Paul will lead the closing prayer. Let's sing the first verse of 507, Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning?
We are mindful, Father, also of those who are sick and those who are lost loved ones. We ask you at this time to comfort them and guide them, Father. And as we go out into this world, Father, may uh, we show uh, our light to each and every one <coughs> that they know that we are one of yours. We pray, God, that you help us and give us the strength and the courage to do so. Thank you for all your love and your grace and mercy, and, and thank you for your son who died on that cross for our sins, that we may have, find that hope of salvation through his blood, through the, his son's blood. And we pray, Father, that you always help us in, in whatever we do, Father, forgive us when we do the error. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.